Welcome to the Potomac Valley Church of Christ. It's so great to be here, and I want to welcome everyone because today is a special Sunday. It's our congregational Sunday worship service. Yeah. Welcome to the Rappahannock Campus. Yeah. Spotsylvania, King George, Stafford, welcome. Whoa. And of course, welcome. Of course, we are here in the Prince William Campus. Yeah. It's not just a congregational Sunday service. It is also... Grandparent Sunday. Today is also the 21st anniversary of the tragic events of September 11, 2001. So we want to make mention of that and I honor all of our heroes that served so valiantly. And uh, I want to share a passage here to welcome us in. Psalm 45, you don't have to turn there. It says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I'll praise your name forever and ever. I will Praise you every day, extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commend your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works and will proclaim your mighty deeds. Today we, we will worship a God who has been good, who has been faithful to all generations. It is a God that we worship today that is good to us. It is a God that we worship today who's been faithful to us. And we're gonna have a great service because we're also gonna witness a baptism today as well. So with that, we're gonna say a prayer for the rest of service. We'll continue on in song, let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you so much that you have been so faithful to us. You've been so good to us. And our worship to you today, we offer to you, we pray as a fragrant offering. As we sing songs, as we see someone being reborn, as we see and hear your words being spoken and preached, I pray that we connect to you. We connect to Jesus. We connect to one another. We pray that our grandparents are honored today. We pray that everyone is encouraged today and inspired today. But most importantly, we pray that you are honored today. We love you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is such a privilege for us to be able to gather together today, this Sunday morning, to be able to worship God. Amen? Yeah. And, uh, we're just so grateful to see everyone home, everyone together, everyone being able to join together in, in worship uh, with all our different songs. You're probably trying to figure out what you are, if you're a bass or a tenor, and uh, I'm just glad that I sing solo, 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 and uh, so it was, it was really amazing to be able to worship God. Today we have so many incredible things that God's blessing us with, but I'm here right now to introduce uh, our dear brother, Mike Nave. Uh, Mike uh, is uh, visiting with us. He's uh, a part of the Solomon Foundation, uh, which is awesome. We love the Solomon Foundation. He's going to share a lot more about this, but uh, Mike, together with a number of brothers, uh, helped to uh, build a church in, um, in Phoenix, uh, Arizona, which was truly transformative. And I won't share all the details. I'll let him share that. Uh, but he uh, has since um, retired and focused his energies on developing a group called the Accelerate Group. And uh, the Accelerate Group comes alongside churches and helps them to accelerate, helps them to do even better things, even greater things. And we've had an incredible weekend already with Mike, uh, the elders, the board, and many others, having great conversations with him, learning about what they've learned as we really seek to spread the gospel to everyone in the surrounding areas and seek to be a light to the world. So I'm really honored to have you here with us, Mike. And his wonderful wife, Karen, is here with him as well. We're so grateful. And um, he's awesome. And Mike is going to come forward now, and he's going to share in our community. Right. Thank you, Will. Good to be here, everybody. Um, I want to talk about Jesus. Right. Let's talk about Jesus, because we're talking about communion. Someone asked me once, they said, Mike, are you a pastor or on staff at a church? Now, I was honored to be asked that question because, to me, two of the most noble professions are a pastor and wife or a teacher. And the reason is both of those have to do with the quality of your life here on earth 
And a pastor has a lot to do about your destination in eternity. And as a teacher does their job, they influence the way you think that lets you make better decisions so that you have a better chance of making a good decision like accepting Jesus. But my answer was, no, I'm not a pastor or a minister. I'm just a business person that loves the church. And whatever occupation you have, you're a person who loves the church. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the Last Supper from a business person's perspective. How does that sound? A little bit different. Okay. In the Bible, it talks about Jesus, and a lot of times it says Jesus is referred to as the Word. So it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In all things, everything created was created by Him. Later on, it refers to the Word, and it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus came to the earth for approximately 33 years. His last three years, he assembled a team of men, 12 men, and he did a lot of miracles and he trained them. The Bible actually says if all the things that he did were written about, the world couldn't contain the books. That's the Jesus we serve. At the end of his ministry, that three years at the end, he was planning what I call a graduation banquet for his 12 people. That's the Last Supper. It's interesting that as he's telling them we want to have this dinner, this supper, that at the same time, some of the religious and political leaders are plotting out to capture him and kill him at the very same time. I want to come back to the dinner in just a bit, but I want to go on. After the dinner, Jesus takes his 12 guys out into a, into a garden, and he wants to pray. He takes three of them a little bit farther, and then he goes out by himself to pray. He prays three times, and he comes back each time when they were asleep. The key thing when he prays, he says, God, if you can take this cup away from me, if you can take away what you're asking me to do, if there's another way, let's do it. But if not, I will do it. And what he knew was about to happen was he was about to be arrested. He was about to be falsely accused. He was about to be falsely convicted. He was about to be tortured beyond belief and he was about to be killed. But beyond all that, he was going to have heaped on him the sins of the entire world, present and future, because it was a new covenant. He was gonna have such vileness put on him that even he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Satan was going to have unrelented access to him to punish him. That's what was about to happen. So that's why he said, if there's another way, let's do it. If not, I'll do this. Now, let me give you a business person's idea of what probably happened in heaven. All right? Jesus told Peter when he was being arrested, Peter struck the, the high priest's servants here. He said, put your sword away. Don't you know that I can ask my father? And immediately he will give me 12 legions of angels. You know how many a legion is, right? A legion is 6,000 troops. 12 times 6,000 is 72,000 angels at his disposal. All Jesus had to do at any time during his torture and murder was to say, send them. Here's what I think was happening in heaven. I envision there's this line, and there's 72,000 angels sitting up there. They're in ranks because everything in heaven is done in order. They're in ranks. These angels are sitting on mighty horses. These horses are pawing at the ground. Their nostrils are flaring. Their eyes are blazing. And there's angels on there. All the angels are looking forward except one who's the leader because everything has leadership. There's one angel in charge. I don't know if it's Michael or somebody else. That angel is looking at God like this. God is looking at Jesus. If God tells that angel to move, they move. Do you realize in the Old Testament when Hezekiah had a battle with the Assyrians, one angel destroyed 185,000 soldiers in one night. If you take 72,000 times 185, that is 13 million people. Okay? I think in military terms, that's called overmatched. 
<laughs> against your opponent. There was about 350 million people on the earth at that time. Those angels could have destroyed the earth 38 times. So there's that angel looking at God. God's looking at Jesus. Jesus could have called this whole thing off and we would have been doomed. But Jesus said, your will be done, not mine. So Jesus looks at God and says, I'm in. God said, he's not willing to disobey me. I'm not willing to withdraw the order. He looked at the angel and he said, stand down. I don't know who your heroes are. I don't know the ones that you've read about or the ones that you know. I don't know who your action people are in movies. I don't know what you imagine, but there's no one ever, even what you can imagine, greater than what Jesus did. He stood totally alone. Even the people he had with him turned on him. Had he not done that, we were all doomed. So when I go back to the garden, I mean, go back to the supper, he's sitting around with these guys knowing what's going to happen. Yet he washes their feet. Yet Judas is in there, and he knows what Judas is going to do. If you want to talk about leadership and magnificence, you can't go higher than Jesus. Right. So when we go back and we talk about the Lord's Supper, it's not something we do easily and we go, well, this is your body that's broken for me and this is your blood. It's a big, big deal. Yeah. His body was broken, it says, his body was broken, which it was crushed beyond, you know, people didn't even know who he was after he was abused. But it says his blood was poured out for many. And that brought about the new covenant because in the blood is the life. So when we take communion, we want to fully respect what's happening here. This is our destiny was determined in that time. And everything that Jesus did was for us. And had he not done it, we would have all been doomed. You know, there's, we say that we're saved by faith and grace, not by works. That's absolutely true. That's because Jesus did the works. Jesus wasn't saved by grace. Jesus did it for us by works. So we have to honor him above all. That's why the scripture says, because of what he did, and he humbled himself all the way to the cross, he has the name above every name. That's right. Any name you can mention is not above Jesus. So let's honor him when we take our communion in a moment. Let's pray. Father, we have no grasp of your magnificence. It's so far beyond us. But what we can grasp, we hold on to tightly. We say we honor you. We thank you. And as we take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of what you did so long ago, it is in honor of you and in respect of you. And we just love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If anyone didn't get the elements, just raise your hand. One of the ushers will bring those to you. God bless you. You know, you learn a lot about any movement based on music. And where there is new music, there's a new movement of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we definitely are so blown away just to see how God has used 
uh, this incredible worship team to be able to come together. Uh, Tasha and I had the honor of being able to uh, go to the Emmaus workshop that they had at the uh, monastery uh, just, uh, just a little bit north of uh, Manassas. I'm so grateful for the uh, Benedictine Sisters Monastery welcoming us in. And uh, there were three days worth of worship and devotionals. And uh, Marcus will share a lot more about this in the future. But that is just the first of many songs that we look forward to coming out. And man, I don't know about you, but I am moved. Amen? Amen. We're going to take this time in our service to uh, really <laughs> devote ourselves to giving. And um, really learning how to give 100%. And Jesus tells us two stories uh, that I want to reference today. They're two very short stories uh, about giving as we really prepare our hearts to have God's heart to really give the way that God designed for us to give. I want to invite you to turn on over with me uh, to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 21. We got red letter stuff here. You guys good? All right. Ready for the spirit to move. So in Luke chapter 21, in verse 1, it says, As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. And he also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. This widow shows us that God is interested in us giving with our whole heart. He looks at the condition of our heart, and a lot of times we look at the quantity of what's given instead of the quality of what's given. But God always looks at the heart and he sees this widow and he sees these rich folks and they're giving and it seems like a lot. But in proportion to what they have, they're just making a contribution. But this widow is giving sacrificially. She's giving with all of who she is. And as we come before God to gather, to be able to give some of our treasure, and as we set our minds going into the week, about how we might invest our time to give to God. And as we think about the gifts that God's given us, the talents he's given us, and how we're going to invest those talents, we need to look to this widow's example. You know, I, I'm, I'm so grateful just that we have Mike and Karen here with us because, you know, as I've been talking with, the, with Mike over the past two years and particularly over the past few months, you know, he's a business person and his talent is business. And he says, you know, this is what I give. I get to give to God with my gift of being a business person. You know, and, and just last night, I was here at the building, and we, we had the opportunity. Me and Ben were studying the Bible. Me and Ben and Sean were studying the Bible. And Jimmy Thomas came through, and Jimmy is always fixing things. He can Jimmy rig anything. <laughs> and Jimmy was filling up the baptistry, and he gives with his talent of being able to work with his hands. You know, I think about the work that the brothers are doing over here where they're creating a, a, a canopy to cover the children so that as the children play in the playground, the sun doesn't beat down on them. And they're welding and they're digging and they're, they're laying concrete and they're using their gifts. Whatever gift God's given you, whether it's to work with your hands or to work with your mind or to speak or to sing like these wonderful singers just sang, it's about giving your all. And I love this widow's example because she shows us what God's interested in. He's interested in us giving 100%. And I want to invite you to take a look over. We're not going to read all these passages. I just have them up here for reference. We're just going to read one of them. But it's interesting to me that all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all tell the same story. So all three of them thought it was important to tell this story and we're going to look at Matthew's account over in Matthew chapter 22. Turn on over there with me, if you will. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 15. It says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him, 
along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity. You should always watch out when people lead like that. We know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what's your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? I can see what you're trying to do here. I'm going to call you out. Just so you know, when you read the Bible, in case you didn't know, Jesus is not nice. Jesus is good, and he's not nice. He's not tame. He's wild. He, is, he, 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 he will let you know, hey, man, you're just faking. You're, you're, not, you're not for real, though. You're just acting. You're being a hypocrite. You're trying to trap me. Show me the coin used to pay the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose inscription is this? Uh, 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 whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. What is the point that Jesus is making? Jesus took them all the way back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, it lays out the man was made in the image of God. Do you want to know what God looks like? He looks just like Olya. That's what he looks like. And he looks exactly like Graham. And he looks like Victoria. If you're curious what God looked like, then you can go... As you're, past, as you're on your way out, look at the little children and you'll see what he looks like. God made all of us in his image. So what do we do with the resources we've been given? We give to the world what we give to the world. But remember who you need to give 100% to. Remember whose inscription is on your face. Whose inscription is on your arm. Whose blood is running through your veins. Remember whose you are as we get ready to give. Now I want to take some time to commend the church because the church has done something truly miraculous. Prior to the pandemic, we were giving about 27%. So about 27% of us, 27% of the people in the church were giving. And that was prior to the pandemic. Since the pandemic, we've almost doubled that. We've gone from 27% of the church giving to now 50% of the church is giving. Amen. That's awesome, right? That is awesome. But I want you for a second to imagine what would happen if 100% of us gave. Imagine what it would be like if 100%. Now, look at the miracles we've seen just in three years. In two years, actually. In two years, we've gone from 27% to 50% of us giving. That is a massive jump. Many of you who have been visiting over the past several weeks, we're so grateful. You've been so generous in all of your giving. That has been such a source of encouragement to us as a church. Now, just so you know, this reality of only about a half of the people coming back and only about a half of the folks giving, this is a national reality. This isn't a Potomac Valley issue. We've been talking with leaders literally all around the country, and we're like, what's going on? The pandemic's happened. People have developed new habits. Some people only come to church once a month. So prior to the pandemic, some of us were coming four Sundays. Now some of us, we just come once a month. Don't do that. Because <laughs> what's happened is, there have been 30 to 40% more people that have been visiting. And Tom is going to share about this in the next couple of weeks. If you go into the children's classes, they are bursting at the seams. Yeah. We have 90 kids in our church now. 9-0 between the ages of 4 and 11. Yeah. It is amazing. There are people visiting like never before. And yet there's so many brothers and sisters that are not coming back or just coming periodically. What does that mean for us? It means... We need to go find the other 50% Come on. and bring them back. Wow. And we need to welcome in the 30 to 40% that are coming in. 
You know, I had the privilege this past summer to go, and I've shared about this a lot because it, it shaped my mind and my thinking completely. I got to run my first ultra marathon with, with Julio and Dario and Manolo, and, and we ran this 120 mile race. But you know, the thing that was most challenging about that race, it wasn't the distance. It was the fact, it was the elevation. So we live here right now, you're at sea level. We were running between 8,000 to 9,000 feet elevation. At that elevation, you only have 30 to 40, maybe 50% of your lung capacity. Let me just tell you, it is different when you're running with one lung. Now, it didn't stop me from running, but let me tell you some, some things about running with one lung. You're slower. When you used to run, you jog. When you used to jog, you walk. When you used to walk, you crawl. You're just slower. You're slower. You, you just, it's, it's different when you're running on one lung. And in some of the areas, some of the ministries in the church here, we're running on one lung. I gotta tell you, the amount of technology that we have up there where Ian is, is remarkable. But Ian needs more people. The amount of capacity that Anton has right here in this camera, it's remarkable. But Anton could use some help with editing. The amount of children that are in the children's ministry, it's overwhelming. And Dr. Sheila could use some more teachers. The amount of teens that are coming out to church, it is staggering. I can tell you, look at James's face. He's like, yes, more mentors. James and Miriam, Brian and Claire, Yasmin and, and, and Brian, you know, I'm, uh, uh, the Benjamins, th this team, this amazing team we've assembled, they'll tell you, we need more mentors. Yeah. You ask Julio, could you use some more ushers? He could use some more ushers. Yeah. I can tell you that we have a half problem. Now, it's not going to stop us from finishing the race. It's not going to stop us from doing what God wants us to do. But I want you to imagine for a second, what would happen if we could go from 27 to 50, we could go from 50 to 100. Church, are you ready to go to 100? Amen? Let's go to God in a word of prayer. And I want to encourage you as you give, we are invested in building the kingdom. Make no mistake about it. God's spirit has put new songs in our hearts. God's spirit has given us pep in our step. God's spirit has given us a clear vision to preach the gospel. And we need to give all like the widow. And we need to remember whose inscription is on us. And it's God's. Amen. Amen. As you give, there are lots of ways you can give. You can give in person today. Uh, you can give by a text to 84321. You can give through our mobile app or you can just take a picture uh, or use your phone to scan that QR code and you can be able to give. Let me just say, I have every confidence that God has cattle on a thousand hills. I'm not worried about God bringing in the resources. Let me tell you the thing we need the most is your whole heart. The thing we need the most, the thing God's calling us for the most is your whole heart. Money just indicates, but the heart <laughs> demonstrates. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. God and Father, thank you so much. Thank you that when you walked among us, you looked in the hearts and you saw the realities. As we're getting ready to give our contribution right now, I pray that you'll be pleased with our sacrificial giving. That you'll be pleased that we're giving the way the widow gave. That we're giving our all. That we're giving our best. God, but I pray, God, for those of us that are giving financially to the, the, the best of our ability, that we don't stop with just giving financially, but we invest our time in building your kingdom. We invest our talent in advancing your kingdom. For those of us that have struggled in our giving, God, I thank you for all the resources that you're making available to us to train us, to equip us, to prepare us so that we can experience financial freedom, so we can experience the joy of generosity. God, I thank you so much for the fact that Jesus laid out for those Pharisees and those Herodians the fact that your inscription is on us. 
And that we give to Caesar what Caesar's. We pay the things that we need to pay. We are faithful stewards of the trust that you've given us. But we recognize that our whole being, 100% of us, is to be given to you. God, thank you for the progress we've made as a church, the growth that we've made. Going from 27 to 50, God, that is remarkable. Now, God, I pray that you will put it in our hearts, that you will raise up your people, that you will bring in those who are willing to help shoulder the work, God, for us not only to give 100%, but for us to give 100% in all areas of our life, in our marriages, in our families. God, I pray that we would experience a health and a vitality and a spirituality like we've never had before. I pray, God, that we can be the light of the world in a world that is filled with so much darkness. Help us to be clear about our mission, to be kingdom people with kingdom mindsets, advancing your kingdom for your glory only. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the blood of the Lamb will I be redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb will I be redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb, filled with the Holy Ghost I am. All my sins are washed away, I've been redeemed. Amen. All right, you guys are so excited about them getting baptized. And, uh, and his brother Sean, his brother in Christ to be Sean, is actually in Orlando at a conference. Uh, you're not going to be able to see Sean, I'm sorry, tech people. Um, but we're just going to hear a few words of encouragement to Ben from Sean. Go ahead, Sean. Hey, guys. Hey, Ben. Uh, I'm so grateful to be able to share, you know, what I, the, the relationship, the friendship that we've developed, Ben. I'm just grateful for our friendship. And I'm grateful for what God has clearly done in your life from the beginning um, of when you, when you got here. Uh, I'll remember our first FaceTime call while you were still in Okinawa uh, a little bit ago. We were talking about potentially being roommates. That's okay. Um, forgive me, but it was incredible to uh, get a chance to get to know you then. Uh, and throughout um, our last couple months, I, I've been grateful for that, for, for getting to know your character and your heart. And I, I was reflecting after our conversation yesterday about you know what really what, what best what verse best describes you, what words I can use to describe like your heart and what I've learned about you. And I I always kept going back to Isaiah six eight. Um, you know, here I am, send me, mm -hmm. uh, and, and your obedience is what, to me, has resonated so much. Uh, I remember it was Wednesday, I believe, early morning Wednesday, uh, drinking our coffee and doing our Marine Bible study that you expressed the desire on your heart to get baptized, and, and I think the, the, the expression of that desire to, what is it, four and a half days to where you're getting baptized, I think that, that is the epitome of obedience right there. And, but also with wisdom, you tempered it with wisdom to ask some questions about, you know, what what the scripture said about baptism and how that works. So you didn't rush it, but you also didn't hesitate. And I thought that was something that was really important to mention. I think out of all the things that I'm grateful for, it's I've, I've seen the obedience that, that you act with on your heart, and that's so I'm so grateful for that. Um, and you know, I think we can both, Will and I, have both seen that God is doing some incredible things with you. And we're really excited to see to see where God is taking you next. And, and I'm just really grateful for that, man. And I'm super excited. Uh, and, and thank you for just, just your heart and, and showing me such an example. I appreciate it so much. Amen. 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 So, uh, Ben, I'm so, so proud of you, man. So inspired by your faith. It's been so incredible studying the Bible with you. Just so you guys know... Uh, Ben's heritage, his family's heritage, is with the Anabaptists. There are a lot of Yoders that are over in Ohio. And uh, so we've been able to have some deep Bible studies over the past several months. But in the past few days, your conviction about baptism has just been so inspiring. It was so incredible just seeing everything that Sean said, your willingness to do whatever God called you to do, your passion to want to serve, your vision for God, your faith to, to want to be able one day to to serve as a minister and sp help spread the gospel around the world. Uh, I'm just so inspired by that. And I'm also inspired to see a young man who's devoted himself to serving our country and who's devoted himself to doing what's right. 
was devoting himself to God first. And a young single man was devoting himself to that, which is really amazing. And in our Bible studies, and I'll share more about that later, I was just so impressed by just your integrity, your conviction, your tenacity, your passion. Every time we study the Bible, you came back with more questions, ready to learn, ready to respond. So, so proud of you, bro. You want to share a few things before you get back to us? Uh, yeah, for sure. So, <laughs> uh, I've kind of known God my whole life, um, but he was never actually the Lord of it. Yeah. Um, and that's not right. And uh, I was fortunate to have a mentor out in Japan who really showed me that the prerequisite for a life lived with God is complete and total surrender. Um, and so, you know, Jesus said, it's uh, Matthew 16, 24 to 26, is he told his disciples, whoever would come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, for whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. For what does a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And what will a man get in return for his soul? So that's what, that's what this is about. It's freaking, it's, yeah, we're good. <laughs> so that, I have two questions for you. Do you believe that Jesus lived, died on the cross, was buried, and rose on the third day? I do. And what is your good confession? That Jesus is Lord. Let's go! Now, because of that confession, I can now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of all your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Congratulations to Ben. Your new brother in Christ. All right. So, oh my goodness. So incredible, right? Totally, totally God. Thank you so much. Um, uh, for all the teens that are in here, some of you have already left, but there is a teen class for all the teens, parents of teens. Just want to let you know there is a teen class. Mr. Brian is back there and would love to have all the teenagers with him. So that would be great. And we're so grateful. Um, we are, I'm standing between you and lunch, and I want you to have a great lunch. But I want to make sure you also have some good spiritual food to take you into lunch. Amen? And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful we get this chance to be together. Um, over the course of this year, we've been following a, a, a series for the year called Following the Fire. Uh, but the past three weeks, we've intentionally been looking at Stephen and his sermon, his sermon that revolutionized the church and really changed the trajectory of everything. Last week, we had the opportunity in both of our campuses to have a chance to, to really look at Steve, Stephen's sacrifice uh, and his willingness to preach the gospel, to call the religious leaders of the time to the standard, to call them to task. And they responded, instead of repentance, they rebelled against God and they killed our brother Stephen. Stephen was our first Christian martyr. And uh, we're going to go to God in a word of prayer as we conclude this three-week look at this sermon that revolutionized the church as the next chapter starts with forgiveness. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, I thank you for what you've done already in our worship gathering, the, the songs that have moved our hearts and helped us to draw close to you, the communion that helped us to be clear-minded as, as we were able to break bread, God. And I thank you for bringing Mike and Karen to be here with us today. I thank you for our friends, our family members that have traveled from near and far to gather with us for worship and that we get to be together with the whole congregation uh, this September the 11th. God, I pray, God, that you can speak peace to the hearts of those who carry with them the deep wounds of the losses that have happened over the past 21 years. Uh, God, I thank you, God, so much for their heroic sacrifice of so many 
to defend our country, to defend our freedom, and to ensure that we can gather safely, freely, being able to proclaim your truth to your people here right now. God, I thank you for that gift. And we don't take that gift for granted. We know the freedom that we have in Jesus was not free. And the freedom that we have is so fragile in this place. We thank you for our brother Stephen and for his example. His example of speaking the truth. The truth with love, but the truth plain and simple. And even though it cost him his life, he spoke the truth. And he showed us not only how to live, to live a life of service to others, but his life preached his final message. He showed us how to end well and how a single seed, if it dies, produces many seeds. Help us, God, to reap the harvest of righteousness that you have pro provided for us right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn over to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, we see our brother... We see his example, and we see his faithfulness. But we also get introduced to someone who's not our brother yet, but will become our brother very soon as we continue our journey through the book of Acts. But before we're introduced to Saul, who would become Paul, at the end of Acts chapter uh, 7, going into Acts chapter 8, our brother Stephen, he, he looks at the crowd and it says in verse 59, while they were stoning him, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. Stephen shows us the example, and we spoke about this last week, that like Jesus who said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Stephen is a disciple of Jesus. And he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. The next chapter, the chapter of the church that opens up right here, starts with forgiveness. Now what you have to understand is that Jesus had given the disciples a commission that we're going to look at. Turn over with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus had given the disciples a commission before they received the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The commission was always a commission for all people. So if you ask yourself, you know, why do we have on our website for all people? It, it isn't a catchy slogan. It isn't because we're enlightened by the, the modern movement towards uh, inclusion or multiculturalism. It's because this is ours. This is who we are as a people. We have always been a people, a people of God who are called to be a church for all people. Amen, church? Amen. That's just who we are. And Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And what did they do? They went to Jerusalem. They went to Judea. They went to Jerusalem. They went to Judea. They went to Jerusalem. They went to Judea. But they weren't ready to go to Samaria because they didn't like the Samaritans. And they, you know, I mean, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They loved each other. They already had enough problems just trying to work things out with Jerusalem and Judea and people that speak different languages. We spoke about that, you remember? Like, they had stuff to work out. And, and, and I, what I love about the Bible is there's only one person in the whole Bible that comes out looking good, and that's Jesus. Everybody else is pretty normal. They're pretty normal. And if you're a normal person, you naturally like the people that like you, and you don't like the people that don't like you. And it requires being a Christian to like the people that don't like you. And to love the people that don't like you. But Stephen shows us an example while they're stoning him. He says, forgive them. Forgiveness opens the door for some really transformative things to happen. So let's go back to Acts chapter 8. Because Acts chapter 1 verse 8 opens and helps us to see Jesus' intent. And Acts chapter 8 verse 1 
helps us to see as things are moving forward to the next chapter. Does that make sense? 1881. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. You have no idea how God, I have no idea how God has a plan to work through tragic circumstances to bring about transformation. The last person anyone would ever think that could ever be a Christian was Saul. And I want you to think about this as we continue our journey today and over the next several months going through the book of Acts. I want you to think about what it would be like if someone came to your house and ransacked your house and arrested your wife and children, and then a couple months later, you've got to go to church and they're preaching the sermon. I just, you just got to understand, because sometimes we read the Bible and they're Bible people, and you're like, sure, Saul. No, this guy was on, he was enraged. He was out of his mind with religious blind zeal. As C.S. Lewis said, of all bad men, religious bad men are the worst. But we should never lose faith in how people can be transformed. Because you've got to remember where you come from, who you are, and what God is trying to do with you. The persecution that comes to the church does something truly transformative for the church. The church learns to be the church wherever you go. So we gather here on Sunday mornings between 11 and 12.30, 12.45 for worship. Rappahannock gathers between 10 and 11.30. 10 and 11.30. And we gather for worship. But do you know that the design was not that this would be church only? The design would be, was that wherever we go, we would be the church. Jesus says in his word, he says, wherever two or three are gathered, there you are in our midst. You know, I was talking last night to, to Sean and, and, and talking to Ben. And I said, all right, now we got two Marines that are there that are serving. I said, and then Sean started, uh, Ben actually started telling me a joke about what happens when you have more than two Marines. The, the three Marine joke. And all the Marines know the three Marine joke. I won't go into the three Marine joke. They're like, you know, it's dangerous when you have three Marines. I said, all right, now there, there was one. Now there's two. Now there has to be four. And then we got to multiply, right? But that calling is not for these young brothers only. That calling is for you in your neighborhood. That calling is for you at your job. That calling is for you and your family. These Christians had a, a stable environment where they had the apostles and they had the church and they had just worked out what they thought was the biggest thing they were ever going to work out. A difference between people that spoke one way and people that spoke another way. And then something transformative happens and they learn that they've got to take the gospel wherever they go. Now, as a church, this is our vision. Our vision as a church is to embody practical Christianity in our families and communities by wholeheartedly following the teachings of Jesus. We are a Jesus church, but we're not about professing Christian faith. We're about practicing Christian faith. That is challenging. We need people in our lives to help us to grow, to be what God wants us to be. I want to invite you to turn on over to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38. You still with us? Matthew 9. Matthew records this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We'll actually start in verse 35. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages 
teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, God loves all of his children. All of them. Every last one of them. In all their colors, in all their shapes, in all their sizes, in all their ages, God loves all of them. And we, church, are at a crossroads. The world is helpless and harassed. The world operates in a state of being like sheep without a shepherd. And we as disciples have to decide whether we are going to be spectators or whether we're going to get on the field. That's the real question. I've said this many times and I'll say this again and you, 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 this is what I really think. I love politicians. I love them. I do. My father was a politician. I love them. I do not look to them for any answers. I do not think they have any solutions. I don't think red or blue solves a single thing. I think they cross each other. I'm just telling you where I sit. But I love them because they need to be saved. I love folks that serve in law enforcement. My grandfather, William Archer, was a police officer, and I love people in law enforcement. He wasn't a particularly nice person to anyone other than me and my auntie. <laughs> but I love him. He loved me, I love him, and that's how that is. And there are lots of you that serve in law enforcement, and I, I pray for your families, and I respect where you're coming from. And I understand that we have challenges in our country, and they're real. But folks, make no mistake about it, there are no answers outside these doors. We're actually here to prepare ourselves to be the answer as we go outside these doors. And we have to recognize that that's why you have a quiet time. That's why you pray. That's why you study the scriptures. Because you get to preach much longer sermons than I get to preach. I only get 30 minutes, but you get eight hours at your job. In your school, you get to be a neighbor, I get to be a neighbor. We all are called to preach the gospel. Stephen only preached one sermon that we know about. One. But the one sermon that he preached changed the world. And the one life that he lived showed us an example of what it means when a person chooses to die so that the gospel could be spread. And Jesus didn't stop it from happening. That's the thing that makes no sense to me. I'm like, you could stop it, Jesus. But Jesus says, no, there's something greater that's going to happen. And Jesus knows that Saul is there. And he sees the evil that is fermenting in his heart. And he sees the persecution that he's going to do. But he knows that Saul has to become all of the darkness that he has to become so that he can see the depth of his need for God so that he can be transformed. Don't give up on people. We don't know how the story ends. Don't be quick to demonize or to deify people. Don't look to anyone to be God. Not man, woman, not an elected official, not an economic leader. There are no answers but Jesus. Church, there are no answers but Jesus. That's the answer. And so as we're investing in building up God's kingdom, as we're spending time teaching the kids, as we're mentoring teenagers, as we're working with couples, as we're studying the Bible with our friends, we have to remember that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Church, we said this a number of years back, and I want to call the church once more to return to this commitment. In Matthew 9, 38, Jesus says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers. I want to ask you right now to stop and put a reminder on your phone. For 9.38 in the morning and 9.38 at night. 
If you don't have that reminder right now, we're going to stop for a minute. There's nothing more important that we're going to do than do this. We need to pray. We need to pray for workers. We need to pray for people that have the willingness to come and to do the work that God is calling them to do. I want to invite you now to turn over to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1. Matthew 11 and verse 1, it says this, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there is not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Jesus, Jesus himself, walking among us, red letter says, John the Baptist is the greatest human being. Yet, he who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. Or in other translations, violent men lay hold of it. Let me just tell you, this is a, a day of sobriety for so many of us. And I believe it should be a day of sobriety for all of us. On September the 11th, 2001, Tasha and I, we were in a staff meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, as we were watching what was going on and our whole country was transformed. And for several months, we saw a spirit exist within our country of solidarity and unity and a clarity of singular purpose. As a mean and determined enemy sought to drive terror into the hearts of our people by doing violence on our soil. That evil still exists in the world. But that evil is not driven out by force of arms. That evil exists within the hearts of men. And what we have to recognize is it is our commission to help spread the gospel that can address that evil, that can meet that threat. So don't take what you're doing for granted. The person that you study the scriptures with, the family that you help to, to work through their marriage, their, their child may have gone one direction, but your engagement with that family could lead a child down another direction. The child that you mentor could go one way, but that time that you spend mentoring them can help them, lead a, help them to go another way. The, the senior citizen that you love up on and that grandparent that you encourage, that mother, that father, that brother, that sister, that man, that woman from every race, from every nation all over the earth that we touch in this place can change the world. So don't underestimate your power. Today we witnessed a miracle. We saw something with our eyes and the angels saw something that we could not see. As we saw our brother make a decision with his whole life to make Jesus Lord. We've got to have the courage to look past our own interest and think about the interests of those who are not yet saved. I want to live a long life because I love Tasha. And I could just spend my whole life just being with Tasha. She is my friend for all time. And I'm grateful we get to be friends in this life. And in the next life, we're going to be best friends just the same. Like, she's, she's an amazing lady. We have an inc I, I'm grateful for her love. I'm grateful for our marriage. I'm grateful for our friendship. I love my kids. I'm so happy I got to see my son grow to be a man. I, I, I'm seeing my, young, uh, my daughter growing up to be a young woman. But you know what? I'm good. I'm saved. I don't live my life for me anymore. And I don't know about you. I don't know how you're squaring this. But we can't live our lives for ourselves in this world as it exists. And I wish I could live a million years but if we gain the whole world, just like that scripture that Ben shared, if we gain the whole world and we lose ourselves, what have we really gained? So I want to just remind you of a few things here as we, we bring this in for a close and you make your way to lunch. It's time for us to follow Jesus. For some of us, it means that we need to get restored in our faith. For others, we need to be reborn as Ben was reborn in baptism. For others of you, God has brought you from another city, from another congregation to join the work that we're doing here. And we want to extend the right hand of fellowship to you. I want to remind you from Scripture, we see how Peter was restored. Jesus dealt with the real issues, John 21, 19. 
We see from Scripture how the 3,000 and many others like them were baptized and reborn. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And we see in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, how the, the right hand of fellowship was extended to the same Saul who would become Paul and Barnabas by the apostles. How they were able to reconcile the unreconcilable because of the gospel. And I want to remind you as we leave this place that this new chapter that now we're going to enter, next week we're going to get to meet the Samaritans and we're going to see Simon the sorcerer. In weeks to come, we'll get some time to look at the examples the gospel spreads to Ethiopia and to the centurions and to all over the known world as we travel through the book of Acts and learn from God's word and learn about following the Holy Spirit. But I want to remind you as you walk out these doors that we have a freedom that was bought by Jesus. We have a blessing that was given to us by those who came before us. And I think it is critical for us at this time in our history as a church, at this time in our history in the world, I think it's critical for us to remember exactly who we are and where we are called to go. I think it's important for us to remember and to pledge both to each other our lives and our fortunes and our sacred honor to do what needs to be done at this time in history to spread the gospel. I am excited we get to be together. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon with your families. I am so grateful for all of our grandparents. I am sobered by the day that we get to be together on and I'm amazed by how the Holy Spirit's moved among us. Let me pray for you as we continue on. Our God and Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and for your compassion. Thank you for the miracles that you've done among us today. Thank you for the beautiful new song, God, that your Holy Spirit put on these worship leaders' hearts to be able to lead us in worship. Thank you for the miracle of seeing our brother reborn. And God, thank you for giving us this moment to be here right now to worship you and to learn from you. May we be the church wherever we go. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.